I'm Zach Foster. I did a PhD in Middle East history at Princeton, focusing on Israel-Palestine. This lecture is a history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's 1870. Palestine is part of the Ottoman Empire. The land is 85% Muslim, 10% Christian, 5% Jewish, and those were also the main divisions in Ottoman society. You got married in a church, mosque, or synagogue. You probably went to a Jewish, Muslim, or Christian school. But other identities existed as well. Arab is an identity gaining popularity in the late 19th century. So is Egyptian, Lebanese and beginning in 1898 Palestinian is also an identity gaining in popularity in the Ottoman Empire and that's because youth in Nazareth are going to boarding schools with maps of Palestine plastered on the walls and school children in Jerusalem are learning from geography books called the geography of Palestine and since people around the region are starting to identify as Egyptians in Egypt as Lebanese in Lebanon and as Syrians in Syria Arabs in Palestine start to identify as Palestinian and define Palestine as their homeland. Khalil Beda, Salim Qobain, and Najib Nassar were three of the earliest. I've written a lot about them in my dissertation and other places, including Medium. That is how prestigious of an author I am. Now, around the same time that this starts to happen in Palestine, Eastern European Jews also start to come to Palestine. Why? In the Russian Empire, it sucks to be Jewish. You know, mass murder and pogroms and stuff. That's why more than a million Jews left Eastern Europe for the US in the late 19th and 20th centuries. And a much smaller number came to Palestine. By 1908, about 40,000. Mostly young, single, healthy, socialist Zionists. They didn't try to learn the local language, Arabic. Most didn't go to Ottoman schools. Many refused to hire or employ Palestinian Arabs. Instead, the plan was to revive a heritage language, Hebrew, and build a Jewish socialist utopia. These were people coming from Europe where Greeks, Serbs, Bulgarians, Germans, Italians were all claiming they were nations and they had the right to national independence in their own homeland. And they told stories about their nation's historic glory and all the Battle of Kosovo in 1389. And many Jews in Europe embraced this European idea of nationhood. They thought it was the key to their integration. Remember, Jews had not been accepted as equals in Europe. Jews believed that if they became as Austrian as any other Austrian, they too would be accepted. Theodor Herzl, the guy who first called for the establishment of a Jewish state, he was an ardent Germanophile who saw the Germans as the best Kulturfolk. So Jews start to immigrate to Palestine in the 1880s, which leads to violence in the 1880s. In 1886, Jews bought land in Petah Tikva and initially employed the Arabs that were living there. But then, in 1883, a new group of Jews arrived from Bielestok, and they demanded the Arabs vacate. Then the Arabs stole a horse from the Zionists, the Zionists stole donkeys from the Arabs, the Arabs tried to get them back, and realizing they were gone, attacked the Zionists, injuring five and killing one. I think historians would agree that, at this early stage, the violence was between settlers and natives rather than Jews and Arabs. I mean, yes, the violence was between Jews and Arabs, but when the Jews showed up to the land, the Arab farmers probably didn't care which god they prayed to. This was a conflict over land more than it was a conflict between two ethnicities or two religions or two nations, at least in the 1880s. Now, you might be wondering, why would Arabs be selling their land to Zionists? Well, most Arab farmers in Palestine at the time were tenants, not property owners. And that's because the Ottoman Empire privatized land ownership in the 19th century and rich people in cities registered most of the land because farmers were afraid that registering their land would lead to taxation or conscription. Which brings us full circle back to violence. Such as in 1895 when European Jews bought land, this time in the Galilee, but also removed the Arabs who had been living there. And one of the guys who got removed murdered a Zionist settler in his sleep. These kinds of episodes became more and more common over the next couple of decades. Zionists bought land, displaced Palestinians, violence broke out. By 1908, the conflict was no longer merely a settler native conflict. It was also a conflict between Jewish Zionists and Palestinian Arabs. As early as 1899, the Palestinian politician Yusuf Dia Pasha El Khalidi wrote to Theodore Herzl, let Palestine be left alone. By 1908, Palestinians are calling for the establishment of trusts to collect money to save Arab land from the Zionists. And it's pretty clear why. Zionists in Europe are sending Jews to build Jewish colonies in Palestine with the explicit intent of building a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. 
and for 90% of the population of Palestine that wasn't Jewish, that sounded a bit alarming. Now remember that all of this is unfolding in the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman context of the origins of the Palestine-Israeli conflict is often forgotten. The early protagonists of this conflict, David Ben-Gurion, Arif Al-Arif, they spoke Turkish. Herzl tried to buy Palestine from Sultan Abdul Hamid II and failed. Loser! The Ottoman parliament even debated Zionism in 1912. Yes, the Ottoman Empire had parliamentary elections in 1908 and 1912, a parliament which was, by the way, discontinued when the British occupied Palestine in 1917. So the British take over Palestine towards the end of World War I. Why? Well, this was the age of empire. It's 1917, 18. The bigger the empire, the better. The British had already occupied Egypt in 1882. Palestine gave them a bigger buffer around the Suez Canal, which was the vital link connecting Great Britain to India, the crown jewel of the empire. But there was more to Palestine for the British than just a connection to India. The British Empire was in competition with the French Empire and the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire. And by taking Palestine, the British were able to both take land from the Ottomans and prevent the land from falling into the hands of the French and Russian empires. Wins all around, yeah! And on top of that, many British believed Jews controlled the world and would support the British during the Great War, the World War I, if Britain declared their support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. So they declared support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine in 1917 and used that as yet another justification as to why they ought to rule Palestine. Shortly after the British took over Palestine, a delegation of Americans traveled there to survey public opinion, you know, in the spirit of democracy. The people were asked, do you support establishing a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine? 5.7% supported a Zionist program, 85% were against a Zionist Program. And the British were like, yeah, let's, let's go 5.7%. That's a recipe for success. No idea makes the world as safe for democracy as the ideas of the 5.7%. Black and yellow, black and yellow, black and yellow. I don't know what that has to do with 5.7%, but of course, it wasn't just public opinion polls that the British completely ignored. Palestinians gathered in Jerusalem, Jaffa, and Haifa throughout the 1920s for national meetings to declare their opposition to Zionism. They demanded that the British establish a government which was, quote, derives its authority from the free desire of the native population. Palestinian public opinion was hostile to the British from the very beginning, and that's because British rule in Palestine was non-democratic. It violated the political will of 85% of the country, and this boiled over into violence. In 1920, uh, and more seriously in 1929, when a ruling w uh, was made which forbade Jews from bringing seats and benches to the Western Wall, so thousands of Zionist youth marched to the Western Wall shouting, the wall is ours! Things escalated a few days later. Thousands of Arab villagers armed with sticks and knives streamed into Jerusalem from the countryside. The riots of 1929 led the British to ask what went wrong. They published a paper to understand the source of the violence. They blamed Zionist institutions like the Jewish Labor Union and the Jewish Agency for encouraging Jews to hire only Jews. They blamed British policy in Palestine itself, which encouraged Zionist immigration to Palestine, which led thousands of Palestinian Arabs to get uprooted. The British report concluded, if you want to stop the violence, you got to cut back on Zionist immigration. In response, the British let more Jews into the country than ever, tens of thousands a year by the mid-1930s. By 1936, Jews constituted one-third of the population of Palestine and counting. And by 1936, Jews in Europe desperately wanted to move to Palestine because of Nazis. So you can understand why British continued to allow Zionists to immigrate and why Zionists continued to immigrate. For them, it was a question of life and death. And just as the 1929 report concluded, if Zionist immigration continued, so too would the violence, which is exactly what happened. From 1936 to 39, the Palestinians revolted. Strikes, protests, gun battles, open revolt, lots of dead people, 5,000 Arabs dead, 300 Jews dead, 262 Britons dead. I love how the number of British dead people is like a precise number, like 262.7 dead British people. But like on the other side, like on the Arab side, they're just like, ah, let's just round to the nearest multiple of 5,000. 
The revolt ended in 1939. The Palestinian leadership was decimated, living in exile. Over 10% of the adult male Palestinian Arab population was either killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled. Haj Amin al-Husseini, the leader of the most powerful Palestinian organization of the time, the Supreme Muslim Council, he was exiled. Mohammed Izzat Darwaza was exiled. He was the founder of the Istiqlal political party and a principal organizer against the British. The revolt also led the British to cut back on Jewish immigration to 10,000 per year. This radicalized some Zionists who saw their Jewish brethren being slaughtered by the Nazis in Europe and saw the limits placed on Jewish immigration as unacceptable. So they formed militant organizations and attacked the British. They infamously blew up the British colonial headquarters, the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in 1946. But even mainstream leftist Zionists took the revolt as a sign that their presence was unwelcome and they'd better arm themselves if they planned on hanging around. So they built a militia in the 1940s that became the army of the state of Israel in 1948. And all of this sets the stage for 1940 when the British decided to get the heck out of Palestine. War immediately broke out the very next day. And during the first few months of the war, the Palestinians were actually winning. Fauzi al Kawukji got together a militia. Abdel Qadr al Husseini got together a militia. They attacked Jewish convoys. They paralyzed Zionist supply lines. But the Zionists struck back. In January 1948, uh, David Ben Gurion, the leader of the Zionist community, explained in a meeting that it was desirable to transfer as many Arabs as possible out of land controlled by Jews. And by April, the Zionists devised a plan known as Plan Dalid, which was a plan to go on a military offensive, establish facts on the ground, create defensible borders, remove Palestinians in the way, and declare a Jewish state. And Zionists started to conquer Palestine town by town. They expelled many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Palestinians by gunpoint. Hundreds of thousands more fled because they were afraid of being expelled by gunpoint or worse, massacred, and yes, there were massacres. Jews massacred about 800 Palestinians, Palestinians massacred about 250 Jews. By the end of the war, the Jews declared a state, the Jewish state of Israel. 700,000 Palestinian Arabs were either expelled or, or left out of fear of being expelled. They became refugees in Gaza, which was taken over by Egypt. They became refugees in the West Bank, which was taken over by Jordan, or they became refugees in Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, or elsewhere abroad. The war is remembered by Palestinians as a catastrophe, or rather the catastrophe, al nakba By Jewish Israelis, of course, the war is celebrated as Independence Day. The 1948 war drastically changed the course of the conflict. It became a conflict between a state, Israel, and a mostly stateless people, the Palestinians, living in refugee camps in Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, and Syria. Some of them tried returning to their homes to reclaim their property and possessions in the years after the war's end. They took crops, irrigation pipes, animals, and in many cases tried to return to their property. 10 to 15,000 such incidents took place every year between 1949 and 1954, a mostly forgotten period of Israeli-Palestinian history. The Israeli government considered them infiltrators and shot at them. Israel also confiscated their property in a series of absentee property laws in the 1950s. Some of the land was given to Jewish refugees forced to flee Arab and Muslim countries owing to retribution that they faced in their home countries. Meanwhile, Palestinians who remained in Israel were placed under military rule, which lasted from 48 to 66. They needed permits to move around the country. They needed permits to work in Jewish cities. Palestinians, citizens of Israel, they needed permits to, to, to move from one town to another. Violators had their property confiscated. Checkpoints, curfews, detentions, expulsions, all of these things were part of daily life for Palestinians inside Israel from 48 to 66. These restrictions strangled Palestinian life and helped explain why it was Palestinian refugees abroad, outside the country, who took up the Palestinian struggle. It was abroad where young Palestinians like Abu Iyad, Yasser Arafat organized. They founded Fatah in 1959, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization in 64, whose aim was to liberate Palestine. And they started to organize commando raids against Israel as early as 65 when Fatah tried to sabotage the Israeli national water carrier. And that brings us to June 1967, the Six Day War. In six days, Israel conquered the Sinai Peninsula and Gaza from Egypt. They conquered the Golan Heights from Syria and the West Bank from Jordan. They annexed the Golan Heights and Jerusalem and applied military rule over Sinai, the West Bank and Gaza. The war transformed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict into three distinct struggles. One, 
the struggle of Palestinians inside Israel to obtain equal rights as citizens of Israel, two, the struggle of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza with the Israeli military occupation, and three, the struggle of Palestinians living in exile in Jordan, Lebanon, and elsewhere to liberate the country through violence. Let's start with the Palestinian organizations in exile. They intensified their attacks after 1967. Palestinians built a base in Jordan, and in the late 1960s were, were kicked out of there and regrouped in Beirut. By kicked out, I mean they were slaughtered, they were murdered, Black September, it was pretty ugly. These Palestinian groups like uh, PLO, like PFLP, they murdered Israeli hostages uh, in places like Ma'alot in northern Israel in 1974. They murdered Israelis in, in Europe and elsewhere around the world, and Israel struck back. The Israeli military occupied Beirut in 1982, in the process killing 2,000 Palestinians and another 5,000 Lebanese, uh, losing 400 Israelis in the process. Now to the Palestinians in the occupied territories. At first, Israel wanted to make its occupation seem normal. Palestinians and Israelis traveled and worked freely between the occupied territories and Israel. Until 1980, Israel approved 97% of building permit applications. Israeli Jews took driving lessons in Gaza. Palestinians opened universities. For the first decade and a half of its occupation in Gaza and the West Bank, Israel figured out a way to make its control over the territories relatively uncontroversial. But at the same time, Israeli leaders coveted the occupied land, the land, not the people. And that fact goes a long way to explaining the trajectory of the conflict to this very day. Within weeks of the war's end, Israel annexed Jerusalem and the 28 Palestinian towns around it. Over the following years, they turned 26% of the West bank into closed military zones, that they turned 22% into state lands, uh, much of which later became settlements, and they turned 6% into national parks. And that's at least 54% of the land completely closed off to Palestinian development. In the 1980s, Israel began to dramatically expand its settlement and enterprise, aka modern day colonialism, settling land that was taken during a military conflict. Israel doubled the number of settlers in the West Bank from, 80, uh, from 1984 to 1988. The result was that Israel operated two separate legal systems in the West Bank and Gaza a civil system for Israeli settlers and a military system for Palestinians. And Israel's military laws were designed to control all aspects of Palestinian life. Israel froze the assets of Palestinian banks, such as the Bank of Palestine and Gaza. Palestinians in the occupied territories needed permits to do everything conduct business involving land or property, install a water device, perform electrical work, connect a generator, assemble more than 10 people for a political purpose. Israel banned artwork made of green, red, black, and white. They prohibited Palestinians from waving Palestinian flags or advocating for Palestinian independence. Israel tortured Palestinians in prison. Israel censored Palestinian textbooks, magazines, and newspapers. Israel rejected almost every request for family unification between Palestinians in Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank. They banned Palestinians from establishing a bar association. They banned use of the word Palestine. And that ban was so impactful that it inspired a PhD student at Princeton University to write a dissertation about the word Palestine. Yo, it wasn't me. It got brought up. I'm just saying. In the end, the problem with the military occupation for the Palestinians was the military occupation part. Israel's rule in Gaza and the West Bank did not derive from consent of the government. It derived from the barrel of a gun. Guns held by people responsible for the mass expulsion of Palestinians from their lands only decades earlier. Now you can probably guess how all of that turned out. Revolt. Beginning in 1987, Palestinians rose up in a series of protests, riots, strikes, and boycotts of Israeli rule. Palestinians killed about 160 Israelis in the uprising, which led Israel to entrench itself, which in turn killed about 1,200 Palestinians. The death tolls in this conflict are always completely lopsided. Like, it, it could be one dead Jew for every three dead Palestinians, such as the 2000 uprising, or one dead Jew for every five dead Palestinians, such as during the invasion of Beirut in 1982, or one dead Jew for every eight Palestinians, like the 1987 uprising, like the one we're just talking about, or one dead Jew for every 183 dead Palestinians, such as the 2018 2019 Gaza borders protests. Israel's ability to, and willingness to inflict much greater destruction and loss of life on the Palestinian side has exacerbated the anger and humiliation that Palestinians have felt for decades. The 1987 uprising 
led Israel to retaliate as it always does. Israel went from approving 97% of building permit applications until 1980 to approving only 22% of building permit applications in 1988. Israel imprisoned tens of thousands of Palestinian youth during the uprising. They imposed more curfews and started to institute policies of closure, aka they began to shut down the West Bank and Gaza. Okay, now let's get back to the Palestinian struggle in exile. As the uprising attracted international attention, the PLO, now based in Tunisia, saw itself on the sidelines. Remember, Yasser Arafat championed the Palestinian cause in the 1970s. He was responsible for the spectacular attacks, hijacking airplanes, attacks at the Olympics. And now he was on the sidelines, sitting in Tunisia. What did Yasser Arafat do? He recognized Israel's right to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries in 1988. He entered into direct negotiations with Israel. This would have been unheard of a decade and a half earlier. The result was the Oslo peace process signed in August 1993 between the state of Israel and the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization led by Yasser Arafat. Here's what the PLO and Israel agreed to. Israel agreed to recognize the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. Uh, the PLO having been this umbrella organization that included a half dozen some exiled Palestinian political groups like Fatah, the PFLP, and the DFLP. Israel agreed to withdraw its troops from Palestinian urban centers. Israel agreed to subcontract out policing, garbage collection in urban centers to uh, the in urban centers in the occupied Palestinian territories to the PLO, now renamed the Palestinian National Authority or simply the Palestinian Authority or simply the PA. Outside the urban centers though, the Palestinian territories were either under shared Palestinian civilian or Israeli military control, or they were completely under Israeli civilian and Israeli military control. The PLO had to renounce terrorism, all the critical issues, uh, Jerusalem settlements, borders, water, refugees. They would be negotiated at a later date, no later than five years from the signing of the agreement, which was 1993. Here's who wasn't involved in Oslo. Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, and the US. Palestinian organizations based in the occupied territories, such as the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, a Palestinian jihadi organization, which had already murdered 16 Israeli civilians on a bus in 1989. Hamas, of course, was not included in Oslo. They were another Palestinian militant Islamist grassroots organization active since 1987. In fact, they had killed two people in a suicide car bombing attack just three months before Oslo was signed. So back to the five-year plan. I think the main problem with five-year plans is the five-year part of the plan. He has a five-year plan. What is it? Don't die? It turned out to be a disaster. During the process, Israel doubled its settler population in the West Bank and Gaza from 100,000 to 200,000. Israel confiscated 40,000 acres of Palestinian land to build Israeli settlements and roads that only Israelis could drive on, known as bypass roads. <laughs> Just passing by, uh, <laughs> watch out for the tanks. Hamas and the Islamic Jihad murdered hundreds of Israelis at bus stations and crowded marketplaces throughout the 1990s. Israel retaliated by shutting down the West Bank and Gaza. Have a look at these before and after numbers. The closures strangled the Palestinian economy. Unemployment in the occupied territories reached 33% in 1996 as a result, and real GDP per capita dropped 18% between 92 in 96. Closure made life miserable for people who didn't want to live inside a closure. Doesn't sound like a very inviting place to live for people who you want to who want to like work. Palestinian militants pushed Israel to support harsher policies which in turn inflamed Palestinians. Israeli militants added fuel to the fire as well. Baruch Goldstein murdered 29 Palestinians in Hebron in 95. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by a Jew as well in 95. Remember, Yitzhak Rabin was the one who signed the Oslo Accords in the first place. So by the end of the five-year plan, Israel and the Palestinians sat down to discuss who would get to take control over the land that Israel had already been taking control over during the previous seven years. 
The process was known as the Camp David Accords in 2000. And if there's one thing that Israelis point to and say, the Palestinians don't want peace, they always point to Camp David in 2000. 2000 suffered from the same problem that Oslo suffered from, of course, which is that Yasser Arafat didn't represent Palestinian refugees abroad. He didn't represent Hamas, Israel's adversary in almost every war it's fought since 2008. So with the vantage point of hindsight, solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict without Hamas is like solving social media addiction without consulting Facebook. So what happened at the negotiating table in 2000? First, everything was oral, nothing was written, no written documents were produced. On Jerusalem, Israeli and Palestinian positions were close enough to find compromise. The problem was the rest of the West Bank. Israel offered a Palestinian state in the Gaza Strip, but only 80% of the West Bank, 10% was gonna get annexed to, uh, to Israel because it had the Israeli settlements on it, and then 10% would become an Israeli-controlled uh, security zone in the Jordan Valley. Plus, Israel got to control the airspace, the groundwater, th three small military outposts in the West Bank. Israel also reserved the right to deploy the Israeli army in the West Bank in case of emergency. A phrase not precisely defined because, you know, this was all oral. And we haven't even started talking about the refugee question. Remember those 700,000 Palestinian refugees and their descendants now scattered around the world? Palestinians insisted on an Israeli admission of responsibility for what happened. But Israel adamantly opposed to accept any responsibility, even though as historians, like myself, I'm a historian by the way, did you guys know that? Even though historians agree Israeli forces expelled many tens of thousands of Palestinians, from their villages by gunpoint and many hundreds of thousands more left out of fear of being expelled by gunpoint even though today the israeli state archive and israeli state archivists conceal files implicating expulsions and massacres committed by israeli forces during that 1948 war so the process broke down in 2000 arafat walked away he didn't even make a counteroffer and that's partly why Israelis blame the Palestinians for the failure. Arafat didn't make a counteroffer. What an idiot. Now it's September 2000. Ariel Sharon, the leader of Israel's right-wing party, the Likud, goes up on the Temple Mount for a stroll with his entire security entourage. You know, just for a stroll, getting some fresh air. On the holiest uh, site to Palestinians, the third holiest site in all of Islam, the Temple Mount. As the old saying goes, if you want peace with your neighbor, then reassert your control over your neighbor's holiest site. I'm just kidding, that's not an old saying. Riots broke out. It quickly devolved into a second uprising. Hamas and other Palestinian militant organizations, including Fatah's uh, military brigade, blew up 1,000 innocent Israeli civilians and others in cafes and buses. <clears throat> this is three or four times as many dead Israelis as the previous decade of attacks combined. Arafat added fuel to the fire, paying tens of thousands of dollars in cash to the families of suicide bombers. The families and friends of those 1,000 Israeli victims carry that trauma to this day. Two decades later, the right wing dominates in Israeli politics. But back to Israel's response to the violence, which as you can probably guess, was more violence. The question is, what was the multiple? 3X in this case, 3X the lethal violence from 2000 to 2004, the Israeli military killed 3000 Palestinians. They set up hundreds of checkpoints. They built a wall, 90% of which was built inside the West Bank. They confiscated more land. They uprooted hundreds of thousands of more olive trees. They built more Israeli settlements. They demolished more Palestinian homes, killed more Palestinian protesters, and to continue to reject Palestinian family reunification. The Gaza Strip, however, was a different story than the West Bank. By 2005, Gaza had only 8,000 Israeli settlers and no strategic importance to Israelis. So the then Prime Minister of Israel, Ariel Sharon, withdrew Israeli settlers from Gaza. Of course, Israel still controlled Gaza's airspace. It controlled uh, Gaza's coastal waters. Israel still controlled six of uh, Gaza's seven land borders. And Gaza remained dependent on Israel for its water, electricity, and telecommunications. In short, the withdrawal from Gaza was a PR stunt. Israel got to tell the entire world it was making painful sacrifices for peace, 
while still retaining almost complete control of Gaza. Now it's 2006. You might remember the Palestinian Authority was allowed to establish a legislative uh, and executive branch as a result of the Oslo peace process. And even though by 2006 the Oslo peace process uh, was itself long dead, the institutions that it created survived. The legislative branch uh, held elections in 2006, and while Hamas bo had boycotted the 1996 elections, they participated in the 2006 elections and won. Fatah refused to give up power in Gaza despite uh, being defeated at the polls, and so Hamas took power by force in 2008 and has ruled the territory ever since. Israel has of course long deemed Hamas a terrorist organization and so it implemented a blockade on Gaza, one that continues to this day. Israel believed that it could strangle the territory, punish its people for choosing Hamas, hoping the population would turn against Hamas. Now Israel did succeed in strangling the population, but instead of turning against Hamas, the population has turned against Israel. Beginning in March 2018, tens of thousands of Gazans have been descending in mass protests along the border, demanding the right of return. Remember, one third of Gaza's Palestinian residents are refugees, their descendants going back to the uh, Palestinian refugee population from the 1948 war. And so it's no surprise that people of Gaza are now in open revolt. Gaza essentially functions as an open air prison. Almost no one enters or exits the Strip. 40% of Gaza's population live in poverty, most of them in extreme poverty. 10 to 20% of children in the Gaza Strip experience stunted growth owing to malnutrition. 90% of the population of Gaza does not have access to safe drinking water. 90% lack safe drinking water. And that is where we are today in Gaza, a population trapped in a tiny enclave with no opportunity, economic or political, no way to travel, limited fresh water, it's an open air prison. And every couple of years, such as 2008 or 2014, uh, its government Hamas gets into a military spat with Israel. The script is usually the same. Hamas fires rockets, Israel drops bombs, one or two dead Jews for every one or 200 dead Palestinians. Now, as for the West Bank, the conflict has also reached a deadlock. Israel is set to annex some 30% of the West Bank, all of its major settlements, uh, plus the Jordan Valley. Remember that coveted Jordan Valley so that Israel maintains complete control over the entire West Bank. Remember, this is the exact same land that Israel was planning on taking in 2000 at Camp David. And I think in the coming years, more and more Palestinians in the West Bank will wake up to the realization that the Palestinian Authority is part of Israel's military occupation rather than representing some kind of resistance to it. And you know, I hope the international community will, 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 will wake up to that same realization. Um, I don't ever see that happening in the near future. The entire international community supports Mahmoud Abbas's Palestinian Authority. So it's sort of tough to imagine them abandoning them. There are too many people who would lose jobs as a result of that. Think of the, all the people employed by the quartet and the UN and all these organiz international organizations who thrive off money that's funneled into the occupied territories through the Palestinian Authority. But I think once the Palestinian Authority is realized, is acknowledged for once it is, that is a puppet government propped up by Israel, I think you'll see this conflict shift uh, into a prolonged civil rights struggle, the same kind of civil rights struggle that black Americans had to fight for in the US. I think Palestinians will also fight for uh, in Israel. Um, uh, they'll demand uh, to be citizens, to be uh, treated as equals with political rights uh, inside Israel. I think that's inevitable at this point. Um, it might take a decade, it might take two or three decades, but um, uh, you know, civil rights struggles are slow and in many cases violent and there will be opposition. But I don't, I, I don't see this as one among many options. I just see it as the inevitable path that Palestinians will choose in the West Bank. As for the Gaza, I'm less hopeful. Uh, Gaza in the coming years will only become more unlivable. It's going to become more destitute. And so while I'm optimistic for the West Bank, uh, uh, that West Bank Palestinians will achieve equality eventually, maybe not in our lifetime, but eventually, I'm quite pessimistic about uh, Gaza and Palestinians. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Foster. My PhD is in Middle East history with a focus on Israel-Palestine. Thanks for watching this video and for subscribing to the channel.